the need for a Philippine critical studies of this course. The need for a critical and engaged study of this course has become more apparent in the country. You will notice the proliferation of claims, no less by the highest officials of the land, that they have been misinterpreted or misquoted, thereby effectively constructing an excuse from taking responsibility over their pronouncements. The action arrogates to themselves the absolute authority over meanings of words, which sadly cannot be claimed by just anyone. Interpretive authority is a privilege of the few. This course, being studied critically, is nothing new. But because this course is an inescapable aspect of human daily experience, there is a tendency to dismiss it as nothing more than a natural consequence of our interaction. Studying this course from a critical lens gives us an opportunity to see that in many instances, our interaction with others and the manner by which we accomplish such is contingent on the structures that reinforce inequality of power in society. In other words, not all who engage in particular discourse situations will have the same chance to speak and the same opportunity of getting heard. This fact is very easy to realize. The more important task of critically engaging discourse, however, is the recognition that multiple voices should be allowed to speak and be heard and that is what a critical study of discourse should work hard for. Ideally, a profusion of multiplicity of voices, informed, sensitive, and intelligent, is the essence of a true democracy. In actual practice, there is a constant need to fight for it. Alan Bell, the renowned social linguist, proposes that our main thrust as scholars of language, communication, in this course, should be the critical social linguistics of voice, Voice, metaphorically, has been a powerful representation of active engagement and participation in society. Methodologically, the study of voice as a discursive practice points to the importance of interrogating what Pierre Bourdieu calls structured, structuring structures, or those sites of power that limit our legitimate position as participants in the making of society. Critically, studying this course also means going beyond what traditionally has become the main focus of the field. The discursive turn in the social sciences and cultural studies have given near dedicated focus to semiotics, science, language, and meaning. I agree with Margaret Wetherill's assertion that it is imperative to include the entirety of the human experience as social practice in deeply understanding discourse. She termed the direction affective discursive practice in which meaning and language are not separate from the body and emotion in our pursuit to fully comprehend the human social experience. What is exciting about this course analysis and its extension, affective, discursive analysis, is um, the possibility of the research projects that we could come up with. For example, in studying emotions and its role in our daily discursive lives, we can um, include in the analysis the politics um, the the um, encumbrances that we are having when we deal with our emotions generally. Emotions, the emotions are a very important topic in this course analysis because usually we treat emotions as a natural occurrence, a natural um, effect of our daily interaction with people. When we experience sadness, when we experience happiness, for example, when we get angry, when we get um, frustrated over certain things, we see it as a natural consequence of uh, the human experience, of our limitation as a human person. But what we don't realize, um, usually, or in many instances, emotions are also social. Um, there is a term called um, emotional habitus, and it is a, a combination or a fusion of a, or, uh, what um, Pierre Bourdieu termed habitus, or the dispositions that we have been uh, taught to live in our daily lives from uh, birth to our death. And um, emotional habitus is basically um, teaching people how to respond emotionally in a proper manner. For example, there are certain emotions that uh, we um, automatically relate to certain people. Um, disgust, happiness, um, anger, um, these emotions are sometimes um, um, these emotions are sometimes 
automatically categorized as being the proper emotions for certain circumstances of certain people, or certain people are um, included. Recently, I remember a news about um, a study that was conducted. And uh, the study is about um, which country is the most emotional in the world. I remember that the Philippines figured as the most emotional country, or if not the, the one of the most emotional countries in the world. That is a very interesting assertion and a very interesting premise. When we say that Filipinos are one of the most emotional people in the world, what does that mean? How do we analyze critically emotions and how do we analyze emotions with our daily discursive practices or communicative practices? We must remember that emotions are, although they are experienced by the body, although they are experienced by the individual person, it is enacted, it is completed in discursive situations. There is no use um, at being angry without being angry at anyone. There is no use um, with being sad without showing it to people, without letting people know that you're sad or you're happy. Usually, in its simplest sense, we try to um, elicit emotions from the emotions that we try to perform. Uh, performativity of emotions is one of the tasks of discursive, effective discursive analysis. When we say performing emotions, that has so many other repercussions. For example, when we perform a certain emotion, what is the reason for performing it? Or can we perform just any emotion in um, any circumstances that we have? There are certainly certain circumstances that will allow for certain emotions, and that in that case, we will realize how social emotions can be. It is not just individual, but it is a social practice. It is a social experience. One good example about the sociality, relationality, and the intricacy of the relationships of emotions to our daily existence is guilt. And this emotion um, is um, the, the emotion of guilt could effectively be seen in the experience of overseas workers. Filipino overseas workers are one of those groups uh, that has so many emotional baggage. Um, they will be sad at leaving their families and their countries. They will experience fear in um, um, going to the new place, the host countries. But what is uh, the, one of the most important and significant emotions that are attached to being overseas workers or Fili overseas Filipinos? And that is guilt. Guilt is um, the basic emotion in uh, diasporic cultures. Uh, the classic definition of diaspora from the experience of the uh, Jews is, um, uh, is configured by this whole idea that they are experiencing guilt because they are apart or they are away from their homeland. And in the future, the myth is they will have to return home. Um, although that is a classic definition of the diasporic experience, it could be applied to other diasporic cultures and uh, specifically, it could be understood by looking at the experience of Filipinos who decided to work abroad, temporary migrants, or Filipinos who decided to permanently reside outside the country, the permanent migrants. There is this um, recurring, never-ending um, sentiment in the Philippines that if you're Filipino and you decided to either work abroad, leaving the country and your family temporarily, or if you decided, you made the decision to permanently reside abroad, that you are doing your country a disservice. And that is one of the premises of guilt. Um, it is interesting because this sentiment is not just reinforced by your fellow Filipinos. It is not just reinforced by um, people around you, by your family, when, they, uh, when your children, for example, ask you why you had to leave them, uh, or when your um, family members ask you for money. Um, they try to extract the proper response by making you feel guilty. So these are the personal um, reasons for feeling guilty. But what we don't realize is that the state, the Philippine state in particular, is also cognizant, is also aware of this, um, uh, the, the heaviness of the emotion, the particular emotion of guilt in Filipinos moving overseas. So that they use it as a way to um, make those Filipinos who decided to leave the country to feel attached still to the Philippines. And why is that so? Why is it important for the state to ensure that Filipinos leaving the country 
whether for good or temporarily, who still have that feeling of attachment um, to their homeland. One of the reasons is that, statistically, because the uh, Philippine state relies um, heavily on overseas uh, workers' remittances. And one way of assuring that Filipinos who are abroad would regularly remit to their families, uh, which, in the end, will benefit the country, is to make them feel that they have a certain attachment. And that could be enacted by the feeling of guilt. In many of the state-produced texts, for example, um, Handbook for Filipinos Overseas in um, uh, Philippine Overseas Employment Agency reports, uh, we could notice how these things, how guilt combined with the whole emotion complex attached to guilt, sadness, um, longing, um, fear, um, anxiety, all these things, the point of the um, general emotion of guilt is being harnessed by the state so that it will assure that even though there is a transnational movement of Filipinos, meaning um, Filipinos were able to transcend the national borders, they will still have a supranational um, control over, not just over the minds of the Filipinos, but their emotions. And when you control emotions, it is harder to break. It is, hard, it is more difficult to break free from because you feel that it is natural. So when you make Filipinos feel guilty about leaving the country, so when you make Filipinos feel guilty about leaving their families behind, it is not just a natural feeling that you try to enact. It is not just a natural um, effect of leaving, of um, leaving your family behind that you try to um, make them recall. It is a social and national um, concern that you are trying to um, uphold that you have to make sure, the state has to make sure, that these Filipinos never forget where they came from. And what is the reason for that? It is not. Perhaps you could say that it's because, you know, to instill a nationalistic sentiment, um, even if you try, decided to leave the country. But in a more practical economic manner, and discourse studies is very big on, you know, deeply studying discourse to include numbers and not just uh, qualitative um, analysis of the social experience. What this points to is the assurance that economically these people will still um, benefit the country by supporting the families that they have left behind in the Philippines. So that is one example, one case of how emotion could be understood in a more critical manner. So when we say guilt, at the guilt specifically experienced by Filipinos who decided to leave abroad, what we can say is that true, you know, there is an emo a personal, individual, emotional response of leaving, but we should also look at the larger social practice, and that is, um, that is configured by a, an informed social analysis. And social analysis will tell us that you know, guilt may be individual, but it is also social, it is also political, and um, it is a national concern. One other exciting aspect of a critical studies and discourse program or discipline is um, the attention given to um, extra linguistic elements of our meaning making um, practices in our culture or in society. Traditionally, this course has depended on the discipline of linguistics in dealing with the uh, studies of our daily discursive situations and trying to understand how people use language and communication. Um, this course studies has conventionally regarded the linguistic um, components, linguistic concepts, linguistic theories as the major framework for um, analysis. But recently, um, there have been uh, movements, there have been um, efforts to include not just language as the main configuring element of our meaning making, but to include um, semiotic resources that, um, also, that are also important in trying to make sense of our daily lives. This means that when we try to understand this course, we don't just try to understand words used by people, we try to understand signs and symbols, we try to understand color and sound, for example. We try to understand, for example, in print, the layout and the, the, the typography. So all these things are part of the semiotic resources that we have in trying to understand 
um, specific discursive situations. The importance of uh, multimodal analysis, and that's what we call the specific area of studying discourse from a multi-semiotic perspective. Multimodal semiotic analysis is concerned with the interaction of uh, not just language, but all the things that we use to make meanings out of our lives. Uh, for example, the, the choice of color uh, of the clothes that we wear when we go to specific places, when we attend specific functions, the, the type of voice that we use in certain discursive situations, these are all part of um, a more thorough and more fine-grained study of discourse. In um, studying discourse in a multimodal perspective, we are concerned about the um, entirety of the discursive experience, not just words, not just language, but everything that um, are potentially meaning makers in our society, in our um, daily practice of engagement with other people. So one specific, one, um, one interesting case is um, the recent elections. When we try to remember what happens during um, electoral campaigns, uh, the best way to analyze um, electoral campaigns as a discursive situation is to look at it from a multimodal semiotic lens. That means it's not just the words of a candidate that we try to um, pay attention to, because we all know that they, you know, they, they speak in a particular genre. So they will speak Filipino during times of elections, during times of um, campaign, because Filipino is a choice, uh, it's a language, it's presumably the language of um, the common people, the language of the masses. But in reality, in, um, after the elections, they, they would, would tend to hear them speak English, because that is uh, one of the official languages in the Philippines, and it is um, a marker of intelligence, a mar marker of status. So, Aside from what they say during elections, we can also look at the way they dress, for example. What are the specific choices of um, uh, physical appearance uh, in, uh, uh, that we notice uh, in, in these candidates? We try, for instance, to see um, the specific campaign materials that they have. The, um, the, the campaign videos that they use to entice voters to vote for them. Um, which, what are the extra linguistic elements present that um, would paint them in a particular manner? So these things are part of the multimodal analytic framework. And um, we will notice that this theory, this particular lens, um, actually is derived from our daily experience. Because we, when we engage with other people, we, not just, we, we do not just understand them, or we not just try to comprehend them, to understand them, by listening to their words. We judge people, or you know, in a more diplomatic way of saying it, we try to understand or analyze people by looking at their, their entirety. The words they use, um, their mannerisms, the, the way they dress, the things that they have, um, the, the kind of voice that they use in particular situations, Probably the hairstyle that they have, the color of um, uh, um, mobile phone covers that they uh, opted to use. So these are all indicators of um, particular characteristics of the person. In linguistics, they call it indexicality in language. When you say indexicality, these are the features of language that will give you an idea of the physical, the biological, the psychological, and the social um, characteristics of a particular person using that particular language. So, for example, when someone um, opts to speak in English, it is not just because that person prefers to speak in English. In a society like the Philippines, where there is um, a very specific and very complex linguistic politics, the choice of English is, is not just uh, is not just explained by mere preference. There is a reason for trying to speak in English, and there is a reason for trying to speak in English in a particular situation. So that is an index of, for example, probably um, status or class or intelligence. So these indexes could also be applied to um, other means of making meanings aside from language. Um, the, the, the clothes that you wear, the shoes that you wear, um, the way you talk, the way you speak. And if you think about it, this is merely an operationalization of what were you call habitus that I was talking about earlier. 
So habitus is the seemingly natural disposition of people in acting, in thinking, in making decisions. The theory of habitus is very interesting and very, very important because what it says is that people are not naturally inclined to be what we think conventionally they should be. Um, people, for example, the working class, um, is not uh, actually naturally inclined to say things in a certain way or to do things in a certain way or to make decisions in a certain way in a similar manner. A person with an upper class upbringing um, is not naturally predisposed to these kinds of um, certain behaviors. But what Habitus tells us is that because from the beginning of your life on earth in society, you are trained to do certain things in a certain manner, uh, to think in certain ways, to make decisions in certain ways, it's as if these, um, these things have become a natural part um, of your being, of your being upper class or, or of your being working class. So what um, Habitus says is that these are not natural, these are not universal, these are all relative, and these are all social, sociological, cultural, but because they are, um, they have been, they have become long-standing in our lives, it feels like this is the natural way to be. So what multimodal discourse analysis does is to operationalize how we um, think ourselves to be, to act naturally. Um, it says, um, it's very interesting when we discuss, for example, the concept of habitus, because he said that even in the way we walk, even in the way we stand, and I, you know, automatically just corrected my posture because this is a particular situation where I should have a clear, particular, proper posture. So these things are not natural, but we are trained to be certain ways. So multimodal discourse analysis actually creates the very fine grain and almost technical way of understanding how habitus is implemented and experienced in actual in our actual daily lives. So in terms of the decision making that we do, it is manifested in our physicality, in our uh, in, in the entire uh, program of uh, performing ourselves daily. Uh, the performance of the self is, when you think about it, is a basic discursive project. We perform ourselves daily. And uh, sometimes you think that this is the natural way that we ought to be because this is who we are. That expression, express yourself or be who you are, is actually a very risky and dangerous motto in life. When you say be who you are or express yourself, what does it actually mean? It, it, it means you know, simply that you be or you act the way you want to be. But that is not possible because we are always in case, we are always under particular social systems and these systems that we are in construct our social relations and our social relations um, actually uh, determine how we conduct ourselves in our daily dealings with people. So the performance of the self is a very political project. We, we might not realize it um, uh, because that's the way we, we've come to see ourselves, but in, if we think about it more critically, if we look outside ourselves, we will realize that we are always within particular systems. And these systems, these structures, exert, powerful, um, exert power in our decision making. Um, it doesn't only mean that it exerts power in um, uh, how we plan ourselves in our future, in how we plan our daily life and how we think, but more importantly, it actually influences how we behave. Um, the, the most natural behavior that we have in society as um, social beings could be understood as an effect of um, our belonging to particular social structures. So th what does it mean? Does it mean that we are forever doomed to being robots or automatons of these um, structures? No, uh, we must remember, for example, uh, we must remember, for instance, what um, Giddens uh, constructed as the um, continuing and dialectic relationship of um, structure and agency. And this is very relevant in discourse analysis. There are structures that govern our lives, but we have the agency, we have our own power to make decisions for ourselves. This doesn't mean that we will escape certain structures, 
but at the very least, it will mean that we will be very aware, we will be uh, made aware that we are cer under certain structures, and that there are times that we should interrogate, there are times when we should question these structures. Um, so the dialectic relationship of structure and agency is always in existence, it is always happening. As individuals, we may belong to certain institutions like the family, we may have our certain uh, religions, we belong to a government, we belong to a state, we attend a particular school with particular um, pedagogical philosophies. But um, at the end of it all, we are individuals and we can make um, certain actions that could deliberately question, that could deliberately protest. So that is the power of discourse and I think that is the main idea of a critical analysis of discourse. Um, in our daily existence, we engage with other people, we engage with society, and that is the entire makeup of ourselves. In our daily existence, we are under structures, but that doesn't mean that we don't have the power to change certain systems in the way we see fit and in the way that will make life more liberating for ourselves and for others as well.